you ask me to write my life. I cannot write my life, for I have forgotten much of my talk as well as the talk of the Arabs. O oh brother, in the name of Allah, I ask you not to blame me, for my eye is weak as well as my body. Omar Ibn Said was a famous and a scholarly African-American Muslim uh, who came here in the early 1800s. But Omar Ibn Said's uh, manuscript shows that he was a scholar. He was a world's traveler before he was even captured and enslaved. It is the only known uh, existing manuscript in Arabic written by a slave. And it's written by a man who is still a slave. He arrived when he was 37. He died, he was over 80. Over a period of 40 years, he knew English. In Arabic, he knew that no one could understand what he said. And therefore, he could be more truthful, if you want, less fearful. The fact that these materials are written in Arabic sort of changes what we believe we know about American slavery and about those individuals who were enslaved in America. In a typical classroom, when students are introduced to American slavery, there is a section in their textbook, and that section in their textbook may or may not introduce many details about specific individuals. So I think part of what this collection does is it lends an original voice that we've never heard before to a story that we thought we knew. It opens a window into 200 years ago. What was West Africa like? Who were the people who were on that continent? So we begin asking new questions, the questions of, about the lives of those slaves before they became slaves. My name is Umar ibn Said. My birthplace, Futa, between the two rivers. He was born in an area which was between um, two rivers, probably what is Senegal today. And there he grows up and he studies. So he says, I spent 26 years studying. And you say, okay, what was he studying? He doesn't elaborate. One has to assume that he went beyond reading and writing to doing much more. And then they came to our country, a big army. It killed many people. It took me and walked me to the big sea and sold me in the hand of a Christian man. There was tribal warfare in the region and um, he is caught. And then he is sold into slavery. He is sold to merchants who were buying slaves. And he is then put on a ship and he sails for six weeks. He also uh, uh, talked about his experience when he arrived here, uh, uh, making it into what he called Charlestown, uh, uh, and being badgered and, and misused and abused to the point that he had to uh, escape. So they captured him and they put him in jail. And so he stays there and He's alone in, in a room and he begins writing on the wall. He begins writing and he writes in Arabic because that's the language he knew. He could not understand what people were saying around him. And they was curious about this guy, you know, they wrote this writing. They thought that um, the Africans had no culture, no history, couldn't read and write. Omar Ibn Said dispels that. He could read, he could write. And he was very scholarly. On Friday, a man came and opened the door of the jail, and I saw many men whose language was Christian. They called to me, Is your name not Umar? Is it not Said? I did not understand the Christian language. He refers to them as um, uh, the Owens, and they are, one of them turns out to be the governor of North Carolina. And he takes him in, and then he says that there were good men who uh, believed in God, who had a Bible, and who read to him the Bible. 
anywhere from 25 to 28 percent of the population that was brought here were Muslims. The same prophets that we find in the Quran we find in the Bible. So he was able to intertwine, interrelate those experiences. But when he writes his biography, he begins with a verse from the Quran. And the verse from the Quran is again a very interesting choice. It is the verse which refers to domination, which refers to ownership, Surat al-Mulk. And in Islam, all ownership belongs to God. God is the only owner. It can be understood as a criticism of the whole institution of slavery. And he does this in the subtle way of saying, you really have no right to own another human being. They rob their culture, they rob their identity, they uh, disconnected them from family, uh, there was no connection. I reside in our country because of the great harm. The infidels took me in justly and sold me. It's one of those stories that will always be relevant. Um, today, around the world, there are tens of millions of people who are enslaved. So, Omar Ibn Said humanizes the experience of a person in his own words. This is a voice we've never heard of before, and these materials have been out there. What other materials exist? What other stories can we help uncover? And how can those stories together help us better understand an episode of our nation's past that maybe we don't understand as thoroughly as we ought to? There's a lot of insights that can be pulled out of it if they, people take it, not with bigotry in their heart or, or arrogance in their heart, but to look for the insight. You see concrete, you know, grass come up out of concrete, or, or trees grow up out of concrete. So out of the concrete of enslavement, you find positive Muslim personalities rising out. Things will get better, things will be better, and that's what they represent. Hope that things will get better.